um, I want to thank my friends for our continued co collaboration. So um, the last, the, the left two girls, Argizelli and Enlaini, and Carlos Olarte is in the middle, and Paul Tero is on the right. And these are kind of going to be a little bit about the four different air, uh, parts of this talk. So it's based on one paper uh, that was presented in 2018 at Flock in Oxford um, with Carlos Olarte, Elaine Pimentel, and Giselle Reis. Um, the ILLTP Library for Intuitionistic Linear Logic. And it's based on two very recent papers uh, with Paul and um, that Paul presented in the Logic Programming Conference in 2020. And he also just presented in the Computational Logic and Applications in um, kind of all of it, of course, this year, uh, virtually, like we are trying to do now. Um, and so you might say to me, you know, Valeria, what is that? Why are you talking about benchmarking? And uh, I kind of remind you that ben to, to benchmark something is to measure the performance of an item uh, in an impartial and sci scientific manner. And that's the main point of this work in general, is to try to think of logic as something where we can have an impartial scientific manner and using this impartial scientific manner, you can measure uh, systems and, and logical uh, implemented systems and kind of also uh, logical systems. Um, and benchmarking for theorem provers for programs that prove theorems is a very old tradition in computer science, very old for computer science, because it comes from New and Simon in 1956, the first, uh, the first artificial intelligence program. And this first artificial intelligence program called Logic Theorist uh, actually proved, 30, proved 38 of the first 52 theorems of Principia Mathematica. So it's, uh, they started very well. And nowadays there are many theorem provers and, and um, there's an awful lot of discussion about whether um, proof from now on will be much more of computational proof or will carry on being the kind of traditional proof that, that proof theorists have studied so far. But, um, but actually this, some of this story is very, it, it's recent and it's not very well, it's not told with lots of details. So um, since 1993, there is this thing called the TPTP, which stands for Thousands of Problems for Theorem Provers. And this actually means that um, th th this is a, a language trying to make sure that different provers could communicate, uh, could be compared so that you could check the efficiency of different provers. And, um, and there's been lots of competitions from uh, about um, measuring the efficiency and the, the ability to get correct results from different provers. And that has, um, you know, one could go for hours on, on, on this kind of 27, 28 years of, of, of competitions on, on theorem provers, but they are mostly for classical logics, for both um, propositional, but mostly for first order classical logics. And a little bit of non-classical logics benchmarking exists, uh, particularly Jens Otten has been um, very interested in that. And he's done the intuitionistic logic uh, ILTP um, benchmark um, using some of the work that, um, that Roy Dickhoff, which and a good friend who left us far too early, um, he, he did quite a bit of, of trying to organize um, theorem, uh, theorems of tautologies of uh, intuitionistic logic, and some also about modal problems, but both of these things are much smaller. There's just few, I mean, one or two groups of people, and not, not at all um, capable of doing the kind of stuff that I'm actually kind of trying to propose to you today. And of course, there's nothing about linear logic um, at the moment. Uh, well, there was nothing 
about linear logic until 2018, when we started doing this, this work. So what I'm doing that is perhaps fairly different from most people working on theory improving an automatic deduction and autom automated theory improving is that I am actually trying to use their tools for the kinds of concerns that proof theorists are interested in. So what I wanted to do is I want to collect problems which are kind of theorems or known theorems when we manage to prove them or to disprove them. From, in my case, in a fragment of linear logic, I want to use this collection of, of problems and theorems to investigate variants of the logics. I want to investigate as uh, also variants of the translations between this, this logics because, um, because the logic is in case are only as good as their translation. I mean, if you're talking about non-classical logics, you're always kind of measuring yourself against uh, against classical logic. So you always want to kind of have comparisons between uh, what the more traditional logic can do and what the logic that you're thinking of can do. The most interesting thing is that I want to use the provers and the benchmarks and in today's talk, uh, machine learning as tools for experiments in logic itself. So we're kind of proposing logic as a, a laboratory sort of science where you, you actually do simulations and you do kind of uh, collections of, of trying different theorems kind of side by side, theorem provers side by side. And, and, and that actually helps you with your more formal investigation. So I think the idea, the goals are very good. The question is how much can we do for that? And why are we going to go for using linear logic for that? I hope I don't have to say much about linear logic, but I thought I should say a few things. Um, so I say that linear logic, I mean, I'm going to give two slides of quick descriptions of linear logic. And I'm saying that uh, linear logic was described by Girard in 1986. So it's kind of some 30 years of, of linear logic. Um, the basic idea everyone knows is that assumptions cannot be discarded or duplicated. They must be used exactly once, just like dollar bills. Um, there were other approaches to accounting for logical resources before linear logic. In particular, the, uh, there's a huge um, literature on relevance logic, especially uh, in Australia and in Brazil. But the great win for linear logic, as far as I'm concerned, is that you can account for resources when you want to. Otherwise, you can fall back to traditional logic via translations, like the so-called Girard translation, which says that A implies B intuitionistically, if and only if um, you have this new operator that comes from linear logic, this, this of course operator. And you can say that, um, of course, A linear implies B is the to my mind, is the heart of linear logic. And I'm not going to discuss the idea of using lattice and cappuccinos and, and, and things like that, but I wanted to remind you that, um, that when you start paying attention to the to logical formulae as resources, then you end up in, in situations that are very interesting from particularly from the computing point of view, but that are um, fairly foreign for, for traditional uh, logicians. So this, this um, so you have to remember that if you have this notion of linear implication that actually consumes the, 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 the um, consumes assumptions, uh, so you have that A and A linear implies B, you produce your B as you are used to, but you don't have the A, you cannot reuse your A, so you cannot produce an A and B when where this A is the linear A. And the only way to kind of have logic as we normally know it is by using this of course operator, which allows you to um, both duplicate resources and discard them. So 
um, when Girard came about talking about these things in 1986, um, they, he kind of came up with quite a, 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 a quite a collection of, of tools and stuff because he kind of came up with soundness and completeness for his logic. He had this have your cake and eat it theorem that, that we have been discussing. He couldn't do natural deduction as such for, for this uh, logic that he presented using sequent calculus, but he could produce this new graphical natural deduction system, which are proof nets. And lots of different nice work came out from that. In particular, I'm mentioning here focus systems and, and I could mention also deep inference and which I think you guys know quite a bit more than I do about, but, uh, and also the, the, the work on game semantics, which is still um, being discussed and being um, improved. So linear logic had a little bit of 30 years in the limelight, uh, especially in computer science, because the computer scientists could see lots of uses for those ideas. And, and they actually didn't import the logic wholesale, but they did um, use bits of it in, in different um, programming languages like Rust, Clean, and more recent Granule. So linear logic has come of age in some ways, and, and it's useful in, in this sorts of setups, as I was mentioning. And there are some provers, there are several provers. So maybe you should discuss this adequacy of, or correctness of these provers or efficiency. And I say, no, nah, we don't have to. What we want to do is kind of collect these theorems and, and, and do this kind of stuff because we want to, we want the, the empirical work to help us understand the logic, see where it differs or not from traditional systems, see what we can do better with, with the logic than with traditional systems. But I actually kind of listed here a few linear logic provers because I don't want the, the discussion that I'm, I'm having with you guys now to be considered only in one specific um, implemented system. We want to be as much as possible um, independent from the programming language paradigm that we are in and independent from the specific theorem prover that we're discussing. So I'm, um, I think there aren't as many theorem log linear logic provers as you might expect. Um, there was a time when there were many more being developed. No nowadays, people have not um, are not doing that much. The only person I know that's still working on it kind of consistently is Olivier Laurent with the YALA, which is just a, a deep embedding into COC. And, um, and the other systems that I'm discussing here, in particular, the one that um, I was doing, I am doing with Carlos Olarte, Elaine Pimentel and Gisele Reyes, is actually trying to use, to use a, one of these terms that you guys like, it's, it's trying to use the minimum setup possible. So we're using mod, which is just rewriting logic and trying to be as vanilla as um, not, not clever about implementations as possible. And you can uh, look, look up our approval in, in this GitHub um, repository that's there, the first one. And then you can think about it. Um, oh, there's a message on the on the chat. Is there anything I have to stop for, Tom? That was a message from before the talk. It's fine. Okay, cool. Thank you. So, um, so now I wanted to think a little bit about how we choose logic problems. Where can we find logic problems for linear logic, right? And I, I reckon that you should look at some criteria for these things. So a first criteria should be that the formula that we kind of use as, as testing and, and development, the development problems, they should be able to distinguish different characteristics of the logical systems and provers. So we should be looking for choicey design points, points where systems differ or, or, or strategies differ or um, where, where we can end up in, in, in different logic theories. It is important to, to see if, if 
with the important terms that we have before, the ones that we have for propositional classical logic and for propositional intuitionistic logic, if they are present or not, and, and how present they are in the sense that, as I was saying, we know we can always apply uh, Girard translation to get anything that's um, either classical or intuitionistic valid into a version that is valid in linear logic. But we end up with billions, zillions of, of those um, of course operators, and they actually make the, the, the proving much, much, much harder. So what we, one of the other ancillary sort of, of programs that we are kind of pursuing here is this idea of thinking about the different translations and saying how, how uh, parsimonious we can be. So this is something that Harold Schellings did in his PhD thesis, again in the early 90s, uh, that, that was called decorating uh, linear proofs and having as little of, of, of course operators as you possibly can get your way, away with. And of course, if we're doing this sort of empirical thinking of, of theorems, we, we need to have a set that large, that's large enough so that you can do comparisons. And you know, if we can carry on thinking about wonderful uh, um, scenarios, we want to do automatic comparison. We have to want, we want scripts that will do the automatic comparison between different proofs and different sub kinds of logics and different translations and efficient times. And, and this thing should maybe even be computed by third parties because you, you know, people kind of get very attached to their own uh, systems and, 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 and their own, lo both logical systems and implemented systems. So, um, so on the design choices, the this, this choices that we've made, um, of course, the first design choice is whether you want to think about classical linear logic or intuitionistic linear logic or any of the um, newer versions of elementary linear logic or light linear logic or any of the other possibilities. And of course, I also want to think about FIL, which is full intuitionistic linear logic. And you can ask me about it later if you never heard of it. That will give us differences in provability. And you know, you can start asking yourself if, if there is a set of principal or more important linear logic theorems. But the first thing that you kind of remind yourself is that there is this easy place to find linear logic theorems, which is intuitionistic logic. So the, the obvious thing to do is to use the Girard translation and take up perhaps the whole of the intuitionistic uh, benchmark and, and translate it using Girard's translation. Kind of might be a bit too hard for the theorem provers that we have at the moment. And there are other many translations, so which one would you like to choose and why? And as I was saying, the point here is this new use of computational provers and comparisons to help to clarify the theory. So kind of being old school, I choose using Stephen Kling's kind of introduction to mathematics, 1952, which has a basic collection of intuitionistic theorems. And, um, and this minimal set of intuitionistic theorems that, you know, uh, that generations of students proved by hand since 1952, this should give us at least a minimal set of, of theorems that any sound prover, any sound piece of computing should be able to derive. And it has been helpful to uncover bugs and sources of unsoundness in the provers by looking at this collection. And that's something that I was doing quite a long time ago with Sara Calvala in Linear Logic and Isabel in 1995. But you know, one of the problems with provers that exist as pieces of computing is that um, bits rot and very quickly. So the sequent calculus in Isabel has been deprecated now and, and we wouldn't be able to, to run it again. The second sort of design choice that I mentioned before is that I wanted to think about um, what I call rudimentary intuitionistic and rudimentary intuitionistic linear logic. So rudimentary fragment of intuitionistic logic is uh, just the implication 
conjunction and negation, fragment of intuitionistic propositional logic. And why this fragment? Well, because the intuitionistic disjunction poses some problems when we are thinking about that in linear logic. You have to decide whether you're going to offer an additive or a multiplicative disjunction. This will lead in diff very different ways. And so let's concentrate it on the easy cases first and do rudimentary versions of the systems. And that gives us some 61 theorems from Kleene's book, which I'm going to show you on the next slide. And they are all kind of uh, carefully written down for you in another GitHub repo if you wanted to look at, which is Gisele's uh, one. So these are the Kleene examples that I am actually concentrating to begin with. And and as I was saying, the intuitionistic terms are not necessary terms in linear logic. We need the translations and which translations should we have. Then have four translations that my co-workers kind of liked best. So the first one is the Girard translation. The second one is the so-called lazy uh, translation, which kind of keeps the, the linear implication uh, packed up as opposed to kind of separated into antecedent and, and consequent. Then um, my collaborator, Eleni Pimentel, did her PhD with Dale Miller. So she kind of wanted to check uh, Miller and Liang's um, translation. So we did that too. And I kind of wanted to have this forgetful sort of not real translation because it's not provability preserving, but you just kind of read the implication as a linear implication and hope for the best. So the first experiment that we did in 2017 still was the 61 theorems of intuitionistic logic, which if you take the four translations gives you 244 problems to check. And then, you know, you then need your automated theorem prover, please, because it's getting too hard for the likes of me. And we had a kind of few results. So Carlos Olarte implemented, as I was saying, this basic prover. Uh, all of the systems are going to be focused systems. So because focused systems are very helpful for proof search. As I was saying, it's the, as vanilla as we can get it. So it's specified using rewriting logic and implemented in mod. Um, and we get the 22 sequence are not provable in intuitionistic linear logic um, because of this not real translation that we are dealing with. And, um, and this obtains a collection of basic tests for linear logic, which we then extend using translations of problems from the other problems from the ILTP and from and that's kind of an interesting suggestion that we had from Frank Fanning. We also use reachability of pe on pattern nets, which is a real problem that people really want to see uh, solutions for. And that ends up being a problem in linear logic fairly directly. So uh, it was easy to just go into the website of the pattern nets guys, kind of where they kind of collected all the issues of things that they wanted to prove and some of them that they had proved and wanted uh, to keep proving. And so we end up with this 5,000 almost 4,500 formulas in our library. And we did some comparison for translations, but very little. We kind of could carry on working in that. And these are our results. And, you know, it's kind of, as I was saying, if we are trying to do lab science with that, you know, you can look at these numbers and start thinking about it. Okay, the red indicates the formula is not provable. The little clock indicates time out, times are measured in, in milliseconds. You know, we, we can start thinking what's happening here? Why those guys have timeouts? Are they more, why are they more complicated? What is causing, is it um, an artifact of the implementation or is it something intrinsically happening in the logic? And, and, and that's the kind of question that I wanted to, to solve with this collection of, uh, of results. So what had we got? This is the, the, what happened in the first section of this talk. We, we have this 
uh, set of linear logic sequence, and we have implemented proofs for these logics, for, for, for intuitionistic logic and intuitionistic linear logic and classical linear logics only for this um, small subset. Um, we, we saw this four translations and we can com empirically, com com empirically compare times for them. And we, we haven't worked it out yet, whether there are patterns on the timeouts or, or the failures. And it, we haven't worked out what does that tell us about the translations and, and, and you know, whether they are good decorations or bad decorations and why they are good decorations or bad decorations. And we would like to do more along the idea of translations. And maybe, maybe we want to start having, uh, doing things. And, and, and that's why I was saying, uh, if we are thinking about this stuff in parallel with the work in, in language, um, language, when you, when you try to prove things like that, then you do this business of ensemble proofers. You kind of say, well, this kind of prover here is better for this kind of strategy, say something complete. I'm, I'm just making up a completely uh, unreasonable example, but say, you know, this prover here is very good when it finds negations. And this other prover here is very good when it has to deal with uh, splitting context or, or, or dealing with or, with tensor. So, you know, then we want to perhaps put the two provers together if you have proof that the provers are correct. And then the ensemble should be proving more than each one of them separately. And so this is the work that I wanted to push forward was this business of treating the theorems as kind of empirical uh, data. We had a very bad, well, lukewarm is, a, is an euphemism here, reception at flock. Um, the, the guys doing theorem proving itself did not show any interest on that because they are not interested in, 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 in thinking about the, the abstract systems. They are mostly interested in specific applications. My co-authors wanted to, each one of them wanted to do something different. And then I kind of came across the Paper, uh, the papers of Paul Taros on, um, on actually intuitionistic, uh, on kind of doing similar work to what I've been describing, but for intuitionistic implicational logics, only the intuitionistic fragment. And so using Curry Howard, only thinking about the simply typed lambda calculus and trying to find the proofs for the, this fragment. And, uh, and the thing about Paul's work on intuitionistic impl implicational propositional logic is that um, he, he kind of could do this business of generate um, formulas and, and, and theorems um, automatically. So, you know, he didn't have to have uh, Cleany behind him kind of creating those, those, those theorems or the Petronet guys generating the theorems because his, he was freely generating this, this, this formulas and this proofs. So I looked at his stuff, got very excited about it and asked him if we could do the same that he was doing for intuitionistic uh, propositional logic for intuitionistic linear logic. And, and that's the second side of, of, of the, sorry, that's the third section of this talk, but the second uh, ways of dealing things. And that's the work that he presented in ICLP. So the main side of that work, which is fairly computation and it has lots of interesting things to do with uh, sequences in the uh, inter online internet uh, version of sequences is, I mean, lots of interesting Catalan numbers and bell numbers and, and uh, kind of all sorts of different trees that that thinking of the of the linear logic, uh, thinking of the simply typed lambda calculus as purely syntactic structures gives you. Um, so the main insight of this work is that instead of just um, looking at generic formulas of a logic and trying to prove 
that they are terms or not from given rules, we only build the provable um, linear ones. And so what you get is true by construction and provably so because you, you, you end up with this collections of pairs, um, theorem and proof. And by proof, I'm kind of using curry howard so it's just a, a linear lambda term, a closed linear lambda term. And, and that kind of generates all terms of a given size. So what is clever about the work that Paul was, was doing, and, and it's clever about it in the linear logic setting as well, is that you, you know, if it's using the curry howard in a different way, right? It's saying that one half of the curry howard is much easier than the other. If you have the lambda term, you can much more easily find what it's a proof of when if you only have some might or might not have a proof you have to synthesize a lambda term to be a proof of that that's a hard problem kind of um, deciding inhabitants of a type is a hard problem but if you have a lambda term with certain characteristics to show that um, what it is a proof of is it's easy uh, it's inferring the lambda term. it's just a version of the Hindley Milner kind of type inference um, to to uh, to find what it is a proof of. So what do we get when we do this this proposed um, this proposed thinking of the Curry Howard and, and Paul mentions that he thinks about it as being going over the Curry Howard bridge in both directions. We end up with an implication intuitionistic logic prover specialized for linear formulas. Um, we end up with a big data set for training neural nets that prove intuitionistic theorems. And, and that was the surprise. And that's why this, I mean, maybe I'm giving this talk far too early because it's, um, because it's all kind of happening since September. Um, but um, we end up with a, a very, uh, the, the set to sec uh, encoded LSTM neural networks um, kind of produce extremely successful um, theorems. We, we get almost 100% um, uh, success rate. And as I was saying, the intuition of the whole idea of the whole project is this idea of using combinatorial generation of lambda terms and type inference, which is easy to solve the type inhabitation problems, which is hard. Um, I am kind of here talking a little bit about how Paul does it, because, you know, he kind of counts the binary trees of size n, and then they, he labels that with variables derived from set partitions. Uh, he kind of has to create this linear skeleton Motskin trees and, and, and then he has to do a chain of refinements. And I'm afraid I don't understand any of this stuff. So you probably have to ask Paul to give a talk if you, if you want um, to understand all the details of how it works. But after all this work, you have 8 billion theorems in a few hours, in seven, seven hours or thereabouts, you get 8 billion theorems. And, and this is quite impressive, I find. Um, the, um, you, you can, you know, even if you don't want to, to invite Paul to give a talk, you can go and check his video on uh, YouTube. That's him talking in this computational logic and applications kind of a month ago. It's the, this thing about training neural nets as theorem provers via the curry howard isomorphism. And, and so we, we have, um, we get to the third bit of our talk, which is about learning theorems. Um, so the first bit was proving theorems the old traditional way. The second bit was um, generating theorems by, by using all the combinatorics that people have mastered in the last few years about the simply typed lambda calculus. 
And this third bit of the, of the talk is about um, using neural nets to learn, um, to learn terms almost as well as, uh, oh, as close as, as a real theorem prover as we possibly get, can get it. So what, what we do is that um, we use all this specific tricks that I was mentioning before, um, and that allows us to derive an efficient algorithm that requires a low polynomial effort per theorem. And, and, and what we generate really is this list of pairs, theorems, and proofs, or proof terms. And right now, uh, the, the main open problem is whether we can extend this technique to harder logics, like the full intuitionistic logic or the full linear logic. Um, but, but actually, you know, it, it, lots of times it pays to think about this stuff in a more distant way. So I'm going to kind of try to abstract a little bit from that. And I'm going to, 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 to say that um, one of the reasons for think, I mean, if you ask me, so Valeria, you are proof theorist and you want to kind of uh, give away the ability of making proofs and let the machines do it. And I'm going to say, no, I don't. I do not. I want help from the machines on, on the things that they can help. So I want us to be able to use all the new fancy stuff that the neural nets can do to, so to help us solve our kinds of problems. And I think that passes uh, through using Neural nets, neural nets to understand logical entailment. So, um, I wanted to see if we can, um, if we can understand different kinds of logical entailment. And, and as I say, some people have done that for Boolean, Boolean logic before. This this is a fairly recent 2018 to paper saying that you can use neural net networks to understand logical entailment in propositional classical logic. Uh, and we kind of want to do it more generally than just uh, classical logic, but the way they do it, require, that those guys do it, uh, re requires truth tables. And well, we don't have truth tables for either intuitionistic logic or linear logic. Um, so the way that people um, normally use, um, could use this, this, this collections of theorems that we have now are uh, kind of, you could you use, I mean, you guys can go and look at our data sets. We have big data sets of, of um, theorems and, and proof terms for these theorems. And you can think of possible uses for this empirical stuff, right? So you can turn them into test sets and, and, um, and you can see, you can use that to, to check that your provers are doing what they are supposed to do. So for testing correctness and scalability of linear logic provers, you can use them, you can use our data sets as test sets. But um, you can use, you can think of them as data sets from which we're, from where we're going to infer uh, the logic. So, and that's what people have been calling neurosymbolic computations. And that's where I want to go with this conversation. So, um, So the good news, as Paul says, is that there is a size preserving bijection between linear lambda terms in normal form and their principal types. There is an old school proof of it by Noam Zyberg, and, and he attributes this observation, which he calls a functional power, to Gregory Mintz. 
a very old paper of, of, of Grisha. And the bijection is proven by exhibiting a reversible transformation uh, between the tree describing the linear lambda terms in normal form into the tree describing the linear implication formula. And, and the fact is that this known kind of makes very clear the point is that there is a one to one correspondence between, I mean, all the, um, each, you know, the, the argument that known has is only two pages long and is very pretty. Um, but all depends on this idea that for this subcase, we have beta eta principle, uh, beta eta normal form for, for the corresponds to the principal type of the lambda term. And that only works in this particular subcase. But the idea of obtaining generators for terms of some sort of logic and then um, using this, um, this generation um, to, uh, using this generation to, instead of proving theorems, const uh, build them up from, from below, this is more general than just uh, the case that we're discussing here. So the data sets are there, can be used by anyone who wants it. Um, and if we are searching for good frameworks for neurosymbolic computing, um, we could do, I mean, we can do better by using, um, by using this systems that we are proposing of generating only the correct results. If we can find other algorithms that separate just the correct results. And so I'm not going to read this one. Um, uh, and I think there's plenty of work to be done here. This is very um, preliminary in, in, in lots of ways. Um, but I, I kind of, I am going out on a limb here and saying that I think this is a very, uh, pot potentially a very useful thing to be doing. So I'm sorry, I'm kind of running out of time fast here. And yes, this was too fast for me too. In, in particular, in the example, I think I understand it because as I say, I have a, a two page proof by, by Noam, which shows that that is correct fundamentally uh, for the implication of fragment of linear logic. But the proof of the pudding will be on extending it to something perhaps like linear nonlinear logic. Uh, because you see, we have the result for the linear logic fragment and that is supported by traditional theory. We have the result for the implication of fragment of intuitionistic logic only, and, and, and that is um, that requires quite a bit of combinatorics on the simply type lambda calculus. Um, we don't have a result that puts the two things in the same setup. And that's where we are kind of trying to go now. And on that, I think I will stop and try to see you guys again.